All right, so I just wanted to um, say hello to everybody. I think we are streaming now to Evolve and Ascend. So hello, Evolve and Ascend community. Um, good to see you back again. Um, I am joined today by um, our upcoming faculty, Ashley Ellen Boss. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about her class on neural learning. Um, it's called Meet the Plants, A Course in Herbal Wisdom. And Ashley is a lot of things, but she's an herbalist. And she's joining us from, I believe, Sky House Yoga um, and the Sky House Herb School to talk about herbal wisdom, um, bringing together sort of the Western practices of understanding um, the me medicinal aspect of of herbs and plants, but then also the folk traditions, which is a very important complementary aspect of that. So uh, welcome, Ashley. Thank you for joining us. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. It's a pleasure to be here. Of course. Um, so I guess for our first question, uh, can we learn a little bit about what brought you to begin working with plants and, and, and sort of how they factored into your life and your practice? Because you do a lot of other things too, right? So there's yoga and, and so I'm just kind of curious, maybe like a, um, a, a 120 characters or less kind of short <laughs> introduction to your background. Sure. Yeah, I, I do have a lot of different interests, but I would have to say that they all started with the plants. Um, as a young kid, I spent a lot of time outdoors and just was fascinated with the with the miniature worlds of mosses and the big, you know, um, just the big beauty of trees and uh, took a lot of time with my parents went going hiking on the weekends and yeah, I think I, I really developed a love of nature and a curiosity for nature at a young age. So when it was time for me to choose a, a degree for college, I chose environmental science because I thought, well, I love nature, I love plants, and so I'd like to learn how to protect them. Um, from there, after studying a lot of organic chemistry and environmental restoration, I realized that it wasn't the planet that needs saving, it's the people that need to know the value of the planet. <laughs> and if people can understand how integral the plants are and the environment is to our health, then they may be more, you know, more equipped to make decisions that are going to be better for the overall environment. So I changed my degree then to um, study uh, at that time, it was integrative health studies, and then went on to uh, have my focus on on plants. So I, I would say that, uh, yeah, I mean, I think a, a a deep childhood curiosity, and then a a reverence, and and a real desire to bring people to connect with the plants uh, is is really where it began. So. I, I think I'd like to ask you about how you bring these traditions together, right? So, of course, um, there's been a lot of really interesting articles, I mean, pretty much every week about, you know, a new study and what a particular herb does with the body and how it's good for you and how it does this or does that. But then there's also this other layer, um, an older layer, uh, which is much more rooted in sort of the traditions of, you know, spirituality and, and, and sort of the folk medicine. And a few years ago, we did a class and I really enjoyed um, what stuck with me about that class was this kind of, um, uh, uh, I, I guess, a kind of a creative association between the plants and sort of the way they look and then sort of what they, how they apply to the body. So there was this very intuitive way of connecting with the plants that I also really enjoyed um, and, and again, that always stuck with me about how you were teaching that back then. So um, maybe you could speak a little bit to that and sort of how, how you bring these two traditions together, sort of the contemporary and then um, the folk tradition, how they get integrated for your practice. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a great point because we are seeing emergence, actually re-emergence of old folk traditions and ways of seeing plants. And then, yeah, a lot more um, clinical work showing how the science and the chemistry of the phytochemicals in the plants are really playing a role in things like um, cancer treatments, um, a lot of work on metabolic disorder and uh, systemic inflammation. So to me, I don't see, I don't see them as opposing or one as higher than the other. They're kind of just different languages. And so when I teach my herb classes, it's like we've got this sort of scientific language 
that we can use to describe the way things work. And then we have a more folk traditional language that we can use. But, um, you know, it's kind of like being bilingual. If you are bilingual, you can actually see the world in an even more complex way and have more words and ways of describing what you see. So to me, when I teach, I like to integrate both of both the science and the folk traditional way of seeing. And I think you were relating to or referring to the doctrine of signatures, which is a, yeah, a really powerful way of, of seeing the, the physiognomy or the, the way that the, the plants are shaped in their color and even their scent um, can give us information about what they're used for. And so, yeah, I think that the two are um, more alike than they are different. And when we start to find the common threads and the common languages that exist between them, we start to see that, wow, the world of plants is even more beautiful and more magical, but also more knowable through the scientific lens than I think many people realize. Yeah, there does seem to be a wonderful kind of synergy that is emerging that's so exciting. So, um, so yeah, maybe we can go into into a little bit about relating to this because in in the language in the class you mentioned a kind of an alchemy process, right? And so I'm kind of curious how you're using that word alchemy because uh, I think this relates to not only sort of the the actual, as you're saying, the the, the Western understanding of the chemicals of the plants, but then also the sort of psycho spiritual relationship to plants. So um, could you speak a little bit to that? Sure. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think for me, uh, there's a, uh, um, I refer to a lot of work by Stephen Buhner, Matthew Wood, and um, Michael Pollan. You know, those are three um, herbalists slash researchers and who I think have really broadened the way that I see plants. And in terms of alchemy, you know, Stephen Buhner talks about how we have these these gating channels that you know when we're born we're very very open and you know we can see and and sense things that um, maybe adults who have pared down their their gating channels can't see because we get sort of culturally um, we culturally start to get narrower in what we're able to actually perceive and uh, so the idea of alchemy is trying to open up those gating channels. So we start to see the world more like we did when we were children and we actually have greater perception of the plants. This is also really aligned with the work that's done in shamanism. And um, you know, my husband spent a lot of time in Peru working with ayahuasca medicine in the, uh, um, the Quinderos down there. And I remember spending a lot of time talking with him about the plants and his relationship with ayahuasca and, and the different herbs. And he said, yeah, you know, the, the ayahuasqueros, they, they make sure that each person has a relationship with the plant and you do these plant diets to really get to know the plants one-on-one. -on -one. And that really, I was like, oh, that's brilliant. And I remembered back when I was in herb school, how we had been asked to, asked to take one herb for one week and journal. And I remember what a profound effect, and it was go to cola was the herb that I chose. And I felt like after that one week, I had this relationship with go to cola that I could have never gotten had it just been something I read in a book or memorized or, you know, taken just, you know, one off just to see what it tasted like. So this idea of building relationship is, is a big part of the way that I see alchemy happening. Um, Paracelsus, who was an ancient herbalist, he was coined as the father of chemistry, talked about how um, our digestive system is like our own personal little alchemist. So when we take in herbs, we actually are doing alchemy within our bodies and we're breaking open the essence of the plant. And in alchemy, what you're trying to do is get down to what is the core essence. So to me, when we take in plants for a period of time and we actually try to create a relationship with that single plant, that's when the magic starts to happen. And people, you know, my students over the last eight years that I've been leading year long courses in herbal medicine, where we do about 15 plant diets over the course of a year, you know, when they take a plant and we do our plant diets for two weeks, and so they don't take any other herbs during that time, just the one. And they're really, really, you know, it's, it's a, 
it's a practice of preparing the medicine consciously and then also consciously trying to see how the medicine is responding and what it has to say to you more than it just being about symptom relief. And uh, so that's one of the ways that I find that the relationship is built strongest is through that, that process of, I call them dieting or the dieta, as you would say in, in Spanish, um, of, of working with the plants and, and letting them do their work on you. And I think that's, that's the big piece and you'll never forget it. You know, once, once you create that relationship with the plant, it's really with you for a lifetime. It makes me think how, um, unconscious we are about those relationships with plants. Like even myself, I, I drink coffee every day, but I'm not thinking about that. This is, you know, um, this is a plant, this is a bean that grows and I, and there's some kind of connection there. So I can really, uh, appreciate what you're saying here, uh, just about sort of bringing this level of, of mindfulness and awareness and communication back to the plant world. Uh, isn't that, I feel that that's so important these days, especially right now where there's so many ecological questions. And I, I think the, the question on um, many people uh, on their minds is how do we reconnect with the plant world and how do we have a better relationship with um, the, the plants that surround us no matter where we are, if we're in an urban environment or in a suburban environment or rural, like plants are always factoring into to the air we breathe, the, the, the food we consume, you know, the spices that we use. And, and yet, um, where's the conscious relationship? So I just want to say, you know, I really appreciate that. Um, and so I guess um, the next natural question would be, as we're going into speaking about your class, um, what are the kinds of, uh, in the class description, you mentioned there's sort of a, a process of a sort of researching and identifying and then creating your own herbal rituals and remedies. So maybe we could speak to that a little bit now and like, what is it then to be an herbalist and a practitioner and to begin to have a more conscious relationship and, and what are people going to be learning in your class? Yeah, yeah. So in the five part series, um, in, in the class where we're going to be focusing on ritual and making that um, creative connection with the herbs uh, is thinking about, and, and I'll be giving different examples of herbs and teaching the students, um, giving them both the scientific, but also the, um, the more subtle energy of the plant and what it does and weaving those together. And then, you know, after they start to see these plants, um, you know, over the course of the first few classes as well, um, they'll start to create rituals. And so I'll give different options. Um, making different medicines from the plants is a great way to connect with them. If you're lucky enough to be able to harvest the plants yourselves, we'll talk about how do we approach a plant? What is not just ethical wild crafting, um, but I would say, you know, conscious wild crafting because we can, you know, we can say, oh yeah, I'm not gonna take all the OSHA, but even more than that is can we break off the roots and propagate it? Like, are we actually being conscious of this being a living thing and not just something for us to use? And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, what would Jesus do? It's like, well, what would the plant do? You know, we should ask ourselves the same question, you know, like, well, what would the plant want? You know, if, if it were me and I was going to say, yeah, come and I, and you can, you know, I'm happy to offer myself for your medicine what would be the natural response to that? What would you want to either gift to me or how might you want to support the, the ongoing um, teachings that I may have? And so with plants, I think that that's a big piece that we'll talk about is, is you know, kind of what is the spirit in which we gather medicines? What is the spirit in which we make our own medicines? And rituals like doing daily overnight infusions is a really easy one that I like to invite my students to do while they're taking my course. And uh, that would be just using an amount of herbs. And there's about six or seven herbs that work really well as an overnight infusion. And then placing it in a windowsill. And if there's any crystals that you feel particularly resonant with, you can place those on top of the metal um, lid of your mason jar. And then the moonlight and the starlight will help to infuse that in to your medicine or even writing an affirmation on a piece of paper and then placing your medicine on top of that and letting it soak so that there's also that idea of um, the work that was done by, um, what was his name, Emoto, um, the water, 
vibrational. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I forget his name too. Um, but yes, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. So this idea that, um, you know, even things written down, the vibration of the words would do have an effect. So writing that down and, you know, that's another way we can connect. And then other ways of, um, you know, I had a client who had, um, had a miscarriage and she was carrying so much heaviness in her uh, about that loss. And so we talked about gathering um, some different herbs and then painting a rock with um, different words and just colors and images of things that, um, that helped her express what was going on and then burying the rock, burying the herbs and then, find, and then putting a plant on top of that so that the, you know, the sorrow can be planted but that the life isn't being extinguished and that it can cre you know, create um, a foundation for new life to grow. Um, we also have, yeah, there's a, there's a number of other different ritual ways that we can connect with plants. And uh, yeah, in the course, I'll be going over a lot of those sort of stories. Cause I think to me, I learn best by stories and real examples and then how people feel afterwards. So I'll be relating a lot of these rituals through story and how they can, how they can use them and, and maybe adapt them to their own story. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I, I found the name. <laughs> it's, um, let's see, it's Dr. Masuro Emoto. That, that's who we were referring to, just so people are curious. Um, so that's wonderful. And I wanted to ask you, maybe we can go through some of, so the first class is, is called Introduction to the Green Tongue. I, I love that. As, I love that um, as a title. It's so poetic. It seems to evoke so much. Um, maybe you can give us a sense of what we'll be exploring in that, at least in that first class to give folks a sense uh, if they're interested in registering. And I wanna also note that you can register right now. The, the link is posted in the video description if you're joining us from the live stream and you can register for that individual class as well if you're just interested in getting a taste of the green tongue as it were, so. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the term green tongue was borrowed from my teacher, Matthew Wood. Um, and so he uses this term in the, his book of herbal wisdom and his book of traditional Western herbalism to describe the, the language that we need to acquire to speak about things that are green, to speak about the green world. And so in the first class, what we'll be doing is we'll be looking at um, just when we're talking about the green world, uh, looking at, I would say kind of as above, so below. And to me, you know, herbalism is a spiritual practice as much as yoga can be. And so when we understand, when we, when we look at the whole life cycle of plants and also look at what's happening under the earth. And so I'll be teaching students about the mycorrhizal network and how plants communicate underground um, and how much their communication is actually a lot like ours. So we, you know, we often don't think about plants talking, but plants actually have a tongue of their own and they're constantly communicating to one another. They're communicating across forests. They're communicating to the bugs. They're communicating to us. And so we need to first understand what is the, what is the language of the plants? How do they communicate? And then we start to look at, well, how do they communicate with us? And so what chemicals and what compounds and what colors are they using to give us more information about the ways that they grow? Um, from there, then we'll look at, you know, what are, what are the main types of, um, what are the main different groupings that we use to understand plants? So what are plant actions? So we'll talk about, and this is really Western, this is really mostly based from Latin, is the ideas of herbal actions, like what is a diuretic, what is an amenagogue, what is a vulnerary? And these are a great vocabulary to have as an herbalist, and also it overlaps with the way that a lot of Western medical practitioners work. So it's a really nice bridge for people to be able to talk with their doctors, their healthcare providers, and speak about the way plants work in a language that is pretty universal. So that'll be one piece of the green tongue that we'll learn. Um, the doctrine of signatures is also gonna be another part of the green tongue. Um, and the idea with the doctrine of signatures is that plants don't waste any energy. So the way that a plant is formed 
is a result of its function. So function comes first and then form or matter gathers around function. So it's like, you could also say spirit comes first and then matter, you know, it configures itself around spirit. And that's exactly the way that the doctrine of signatures work. So we have to think about what is the function of plant leaves? What is the function? Why would a plant have a flower that's shaped like a tube rather than it's shaped open like a daisy? And so when we look at the, you know, we can kind of go, um, we can go backwards from the form and then say, well, why? Why is it like that? And then come into the deeper essence of the function. And then we get all sorts of insights because our bodies are designed just like plants. We have to respire, they respire. They have to see, we have to see, but they have different organs and different ways of seeing, of smelling, of um, feeling the world. So the, the signatures can give us a view into the specific way that individual plants, rather than just plants in general, but how specific plants engage with the world and how we can see them and see their medicine in a different way. Fantastic answer. Um, I'm tempted to ask you more questions, but I'm going to save those for the <laughs> class and for the students to be able to ask during the class. But um, maybe uh, as, as a, a closing question or two, we can simply um, let people um, do, do, do students, prospective students need to know anything prior to this, or, or is this a class that anybody can take who wants to begin working with herbal medicine? Yeah, it's designed for both. So my goal is to have this be accessible to the person who maybe knows how to identify a dandelion. Like they've seen dandelions and that might be where their herbal knowledge ends. So I'm gonna be breaking it down into the essential bits for beginners, but also I think, you know, even, I think even somebody who is a uh, practicing herbalist will still be able to gather things from this course because it's not, it's, it's I think when I sit at the foot of an herbalist, um, I always learn something new because of the clinical stories they have to share, the way that they use plants. And especially, you know, if you're coming from different bioregions, sometimes the way that we traditionally use plants can be a little bit different. So my hope is to create a space that everyone feels welcome and everyone can contribute too. And because these are going to be live classroom experiences, I love chat box. And, and one of my favorite things about teaching online is being able to dialogue with students. So if there is someone who says, well, you know, hey, I've never heard of that before, whether they're a new or a practice herbalist, um, you know, that that's where this can become really dynamic and it can be very educational and make sure that everyone feels like they're, you know, they're on the same page and getting what it is that they came to learn. Is there any anything that, um, I guess a more technical question about preparation is for students who want to take this class, will they need anything to prepare? Um, you know, jars, uh, <laughs> gathering materials, I'm curious. Yeah, so they will need some materials so that they can, I would say, get the most out of the course. And I have an herbal supply list that people who register will receive. And of course, if you want to see it beforehand, uh, you know, they can email you or they can email me and I'm happy to send them with this list. But the basics are, yeah, like you mentioned, a glass jar with a sealable lid, um, dried herbs. And I have a suggestion of six herbs that they can purchase from a variety of organic growers, both on the East Coast and West Coast. Um, also some um, alcohol so that they can do the alchemy of extraction when we get into our medicine making. And I'll be teaching them how to make tinctures. Um, so, you know, Brandy, Everclear, we'll talk about some different options, um, but some sort of alcohol that they can use to do those extractions with. And then also um, some sort of base carrier oil. And the carrier oil can be olive oil or um, sunflower seed oil, coconut oil. So yeah, I'm happy to provide people with a list of things, but it shouldn't be too much. And I would say, you know, all of it should be under a hundred dollars. And if that even feels like too much, um, you know, we can pare that down to make it affordable and stretch out what they're going to need over the course of those months so that they're just kind of buying things as they need to for each unit. 
Got it. And so for our final question, and maybe actually before I ask that, um, just for technical information, if you haven't done a neuro class before, these are going to be online. So the format that you see that we're in right now, this is we're using Zoom. Um, that's what we use for all of our webinars. Um, we use Zoom meetings. That way everyone's got a little video box and they can interact. It's just a little bit more intimate. I, I find it feels like we're really in a shared space together. Um, and uh, Nora also has a class portal. So that's a place where you will find all of your um, class information, any of the recorded lectures that you may have missed or you want to review. There's gonna be a video and an audio recording you can download and re-listen to. And there's also a class forum for those of you who want to share some of your experiences and, and maybe post your questions before the class. So all of those things are gonna be available to you. Um, if you're concerned about missing anything live, don't worry about it. It'll all be up there and there'll be a little bit of a virtual container for this class as well. So just wanted to plug that um, because that's a frequent question. But um, for my final question, for those who are interested in taking this and are wondering if there's anything beyond the physical preparation and resources and materials, um, do you have any tips or suggestions just in terms of reorienting oneself towards plans? Is there is there kind of a daily mindful practice people perhaps could take or um, a, a little micro meditation in, in relation to the kinds of herbs that we use on a daily basis? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, I think um, one of the poets that has inspired my work also very deeply is Mary Oliver, who we recently, he recently lost. And in her book, um, The Poetry uh, or the Writer's Manual, she talks about how important it is if you really want to get good at something, or if you really want to know something that you have to do it every day. So my suggestion would be to people that are either going to take the course or just want to learn more about plants is to develop some daily practice. And so I'll give you a few examples of things that you might, you know, depending on your natural inclinations, you might choose one over the other, but one would be to be out, get outside every day. And if there's a trail or if you live in the city, there's a park um, or just any place with plants, just to try to make it a priority, whether it's rain or shine or snow, to get outside and to look around and to watch over the course of a year or months, you know, right now we're heading into spring, just how plants are changing. How are they adapting to the changes in weather, um, to the changes in their environment? The second one would be to draw plants. And that's something that I picked up um, a few summers ago is every morning I would wake up and I would do my, my daily meditation and morning yoga practice. And then I'd go outside and I would just sit with a notebook and I would just start to draw the plants. And in that way, I could, I would starting to, you know, I, I could see things I hadn't seen before in some of the plants that I used so, so regularly. So drawing the plants is a really nice practice. Um, and then doing the plant diet. So just picking a plant that, you're resonant with, you know, a plant that you've been attracted to that probably has some qualities that could really benefit you. And uh, if you want to start really safe and simple, you could do just a tincture and start with one to three drops daily and just take it. And when you take the plant, it's not just, okay, you know, drop, drop, drop. Okay. Now I'm going to zoom out the door, but it's, you take a few drops on your tongue and then you sit quietly and just kind of tune into the tastes. What does it feel like in your mouth? What do you feel in your body as a response to the plant? Where does your mind go? You know, does it lift up into thought? Does it drop down? And just to take, you know, even if it's just one or two minutes with that essence on your tongue, that ritual will really start to connect you with a lot of the qualities of that plant. And uh, what I love about that is if you do that for a week, and then research the plant and see what it's supposed to do, you'll be amazed that you actually probably picked up on a lot of that just through that conscious connecting. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Um, really looking forward to your class. We begin, uh, it's gonna be five sessions and we begin on Saturday, April 13th, and that's gonna be 11 a.m. They're gonna be nice long seminars, so about three hours or so. So a lot of opportunity for students to really engage and really kind of have a deep learning experience. So I just wanna thank you for your wisdom and your knowledge, and I'm just so excited to, to begin with you next next month. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. And thank you for this opportunity. I'm so excited to be working with Nora. Of course. All right. And bye, everybody in the live stream. Um, we'll tune in with you for the class. Take care. Okay. Bye.